Um, we have a full day today, so I think it's important that we that we uh, start pretty promptly. Um, uh, particularly, let me welcome um, ambassadors Hashmi and uh, from from Pakistan and Ambassador Silva from Sri Lanka, who are joining us on the panels this morning. I know they have a a, a very busy schedule, so that that's very much appreciated. And also to colleagues from across the UN system who will be participating in the meeting today. That, that sense of, a, of, co of collaboration across the system is an important part of the development account projects, uh, which uh, today's uh, meeting uh, 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 is, based, is based upon uh, the, the development account project on mobilizing financial resources uh, for development in the time of COVID-19 was a development account project um, that was launched in early 2020, um, done with the, obviously with the particular challenges uh, being posed by COVID-19 in, in mind. And, and today's meeting will, in that sense, uh, be a culmination of that project. But importantly, it's not, I hope, the end of the research and the outputs that have been generated uh, during the project. Um, the challenges that, that we've, we've been in addressing uh, in this project obviously are continuing. COVID-19 itself is not over. Uh, and, and in many respects, those challenges are, are deepening as COVID-19 not only throws in its own specific uh, issues around around the health pandemic itself, but has also very much exposed a whole range of long-standing challenges uh, facing developing countries in their integration into uh, the global economy, a global economy that is not only highly interdependent, but also hugely uh, asymmetric in, in terms of its uh, impact on, on countries. Uh, and that's particularly true around the issues that we've been examining in, in this project uh, of resource mobilization, both in response to short-term uh, shocks, but also in, in, in terms of the, long, the mobilization of resources for longer-term uh, development challenges. Uh, clearly in, in that context, issues around debt vulnerable, vulnerability have been particularly important in terms of the uh, design of the project. Has to be said, though, that many of those challenges were already apparent before COVID-19 uh, hit. Uh, work that we did in the Trade and Development Report in 2019 was already raising doubts about delivering on the Sustainable Development Goals, given the kinds of burden that accumulated debt pressures we're placing uh, on many on many developing countries, and that that situation has clearly uh, got a lot a lot worse. Uh, the COVID nineteen experience also exposed, I think, the vulnerability of develop many developing countries at all levels, not just at least developed countries, to the threat of uh, vicious development spirals taking hold, capital flight triggering exchange rate depreciation and, and, and widening interest rate spreads, um, the hemorrhaging of, of, of foreign exchange reserves and the, and the, and the problems that poses, uh, and the lack of resp effective responses, given the scale of these problems that the multilateral system uh, made to, I mean, we talk, we talk endlessly about a global financial safety net but given the experience of many countries, I'm, I'm sure the discussion around Sri Lanka will expose that in a particularly visceral way to talk of a global financial safety net, given the kinds of damage and, and, and stresses that developing countries have been facing as a response to shocks that have nothing to do with their own um, uh, and policy decisions, but very much have been generated by external factors. I, I think I think 
that has been a sobering reminder, I think, to many of us of, of, the, of the shortcomings of the international financial system and the need uh, for, for widespread reform if we're going to deliver the sustainable development goals in the time frame that we're committed to. Um, the project, of course, has, has uh, been part, as I said, of UNCAD's wider research on these issues, and it's also continuing, I think, in response, in, in terms of UNCTAD's response to the war in Ukraine and the consequences that is having, again, an external shock that developing countries have had no uh, uh, um, role in triggering. Um, but, but I think the project has also been important in, in, again, being able to respond in the way we have to, to, to the consequences of the war. But in terms of the particular issues that, that will be highlighted in the, in the seminar today, I think, I think what, what we really have tried to do in the project is to provide some usable tools to developing countries to help them diagnose their financial and macroeconomic vulnerabilities in a, in a timely fashion and, and to, to also help design effect, more effective responses uh, to deal with those vulnerabilities and colleagues will, will discuss the particulars during the course of the, of the seminar. Um, it's also, I think, done a job of providing a, a picture of the global landscape. That's something obviously that UNCTAD uh, is tasked with doing anyway, but it's very difficult often for countries that find themselves under the stresses that, that uh, have been triggered by events such as COVID-19 to step back and look at the wider picture and the wider set of circumstances that they must uh, understand if they're gonna uh, effectively deal with their immediate uh, short-term uh, circumstances, which can often be overwhel overwhelming for policymakers. In, in developing countries. Um, and as I said, I think there's a particular focus, and again, we will discuss this in more detail, on the challenges around debt sustainability. Um, UNCAD has long been critical of the work that has come out of the Washington institutions around uh, debt, uh, debt, debt management, debt sustainability. Um, and whilst there were, there were, there were some progress in, in, in terms of the response of the G20 and, and the IMF during the crisis, I think it's fair to say that that response has, has been adequate in, in, in light of the scale of the challenges and the need for a second opinion on debt sustainability issue, around debt sustainability issues. And indeed the need, I think, which I think developing countries need to think all the more harder about of a forum to discuss issues around debt sustainability, which is not simply dominated by the interests of the creditor countries, which is the case uh, at the moment, whether that, that's true of the Washington institutions, obviously who are themselves creditors, it's also true of the Paris Club uh, and, and other uh, initiatives at the international level. And I, I, think, I think that need to think hard amongst developing countries about whether we have the architecture in place to deal with problems that are, are certainly not going away and almost certainly going to intensify over the coming uh, uh, few years, given the very fragile state of the global economy and the policy responses that we've, been, we've begun to see emerging from the uh, advanced economies to deal with their own internal uh, challenges and imbalances. So I, I, think, I think the project, as I said, it's an end of project uh, uh, seminar, but I think it speaks to challenges that are, are certainly not coming to an end. And, and I hope that the, the outputs that, that, that have come from the project will be of, of use um, in, as, we, as we confront uh, these challenges moving forward. Um, so, so let me uh, begin uh, the morning session and welcome Ambassador Hashmi of uh, the Islamic Republic of, of Pakistan. It's, it's a pleasure 
to see uh, you, Ambassador. I know you have a, a busy schedule. Ambassador Hashmi has a, an extensive career in the Pakistani uh, International Foreign Service and, and brings a, a wealth of knowledge to, to the, uh, these, the, the challenges that we will discuss over the course of this seminar. So, Ambassador Hashmi, let me give you the, the screen. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone uh, joining uh, virtually. First of all, thank you uh, to Ankhtar for organizing uh, this very timely event. Um, and I'm grateful uh, for this opportunity to speak um, and share some thoughts um, on, on issues that are very contemporary, very relevant, and have direct impacts on the lives of millions of people. Um, so as Richard also mentioned, uh, the global uh, economic outlook uh, remains highly fragile and uncertain. Um, on top of it, we have the, uh, the war in Ukraine and its impacts uh, and the continuing uh, pandemic risks and whatever that uh, means in economic uh, and social terms. Um, <clears throat> and these impacts are, uh, you know, from the pandemic, from the war, and their impacts are reverberating across the world. Um, in many countries, um, they have exacerbated uh, supply bottlenecks um, and further fueled inflationary pressures. And uh, there are, you know, very high risks of stagflation. Um, a possible, and we are not, as many have said, um, we are not out of the woods as far as the pandemic is concerned so, so far. So it's a resurgence or, you know, coming back is still, uh, has not, still not been ruled out. The important point I want to make here is that these shocks do not impact all countries and people in the same way. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at the um, financing horizon, what we observe, as far as I, we can see, there is a great finance divide that has developed and it's in fact growing. And uh, what, has, what this has done is it has sharply curtailed the ability of developing countries to respond to and recover from the pandemic. Um, and also from the effects of uh, conflict in, in Ukraine. Um, so this great divide uh, or growing divide is eroding also the already strained capacity of developing countries to mitigate the impacts of these multiple and in some ways intersecting crises and to invest so their capability or capacity to devote resources or invest in the achievement of sustainable development has been significantly eroded. If we look at the uh, um, response from the developed countries, they were able to finance their recovery or uh, response, first the response uh, at historically low interest rates. On the contrary, many developing countries were obliged to borrow at significantly higher costs to finance their response to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, globally, many developing countries were forced to cut budget for education, infrastructure, and other capital spending as a result of the pandemic. Now, just to give uh, some idea as to what this divide looks like, uh, let me illustrate uh, a few points. So on average, developed countries spend 3.5% of revenue on interest on the debt, vis-a-vis 14% of revenue for the least developing countries. 
despite much lower debt levels. Secondly, about 60% of LDCs and other low-income countries are now assessed at a high risk of or in debt distress. And this uh, represents 30%, uh, which is double the, the figure compared with 2015. The average interest cost of outstanding government debt is 1% in developed countries, while it is over 3% in developing countries. Some developing countries are paying over 8% on commercial borrowing. This translates into billions of dollars spent on servicing loans and a net loss to uh, for many developing countries in terms of achievement of their development plans for their people. As I said earlier, the Ukraine conflict is also compounding stresses through higher energy and commodity prices, renewed supply chain disruptions, higher inflation coupled with lower growth and increased volatility in um, financial markets. So even before the latest sharp increase in global oil and food prices driven by geopolitical events, rising inflationary pressures had promoted policy makers in developing countries to tighten their fiscal policies, which in turn led to further derailment in their economic growth prospects. A year ago, the United Nations had warned of the risk of a diverging world that could lead to a lost decade for sustainable development. Now at the halfway mark to implement the 2030 agenda, divergence is our reality. Um, while many developed countries saw a rapid economic recovery from the pandemic shock in 2021, developing countries could not regain lost ground. In developing countries, GDP per capita was projected to remain below 2019 levels by the end of 2023. This is even before accounting for the fallout from the war in Ukraine. The result is a severe setback to the achievement of SDGs with an additional 77 million people living in extreme poverty in 2021 and a dramatic increase in terms of inequality. Unless this course is reversed, this di these divergences will persist and may further intensify over the coming months and years, exacerbating inequality, poverty, and social instability. To enhance developing countries' access to financing for their crisis response, and for productive investments in recovery, climate action, and the SDGs, I would like to share some policy options uh, from the short to long term. Now, some steps to address the socioeconomic fallout from the COVID pandemic have been taken, such as the creation of a new special drawing rights, provision of emergency lending, at large scale and the G20 debt service suspension initiative. These measures have helped to finance the pandemic response and limit the number of countries in distress thus far. But whether these, whether these measures have been sufficient or commensurate with the, the enormity of the challenge, that's another story. And I'll come back to that. Um, at this stage, I would say that additional efforts are definitely needed to close the large recovery gap, address the fallout from the, to address the fallout from the war in Ukraine and rising food and energy prices. Uh, so in specific terms and, and in the short term in the, uh, for policy options, I would like to first highlight that what, would, what is needed is to extend the moratorium on debt payments. And this extension should continue until the ongoing and multi-dimensional crises taper off. Um, 
international support such as the DSSI, as I said earlier, did enable beneficiaries to increase COVID-related financing uh, spending, but nowhere near the levels of richer countries. This finances, financing or debt suspension arrangement also could not prevent spending cuts in areas critical to long-term sustainable development. Debt which had built up over the last decade has now reached critical levels. Globally, three in five of the poorest countries are at high risk or already in debt distress prior to the military conflict in Ukraine. Hence the imperative to extend the moratorium on debt payments until the existing crisis recede and economic recovery begins to take shape. Uh, let me say a few words on the common framework uh, for debt treatment. Uh, it, it represents a meaningful step forward within the international debt architecture. But if we look uh, closely, um, progress has been slow. Um, there is a need to strengthen this framework inter alia by clarifying how comparative, comparability of treatment for commercial and private credit, creditors will be determined and implemented and expanding eligibility to highly indebted middle income countries. In terms of utilization of uh, unused SDRs, um, there is a broad consensus that channeling SDRs from countries with strong external positions to countries most in need can strengthen the impact of the original allocation. Since SDRs are distributed in proportion to countries' IMF quota shares, Developing countries received only around one third of the total, with least developed countries receiving just over $15 billion and small island developing states just over $9 billion. Several countries with strong external positions have expressed interest in a voluntary channeling of their SDRs to countries most in need, with both the G7 and G20 calling for a total global reallocation of 100 billion US dollars while preserving the reserve asset characteristics of channeled SDRs. As of mid-February this year, countries had pledged a total of 60 billion dollars. Um, there are a few mechanisms under discussion to reallocate the SDRs, but I guess I won't go into those details. These are technical details. Um, and I'm sure the discussions today will touch on uh, the panelists uh, will will you know shed light and speak more to these technical details. Um, these uh, some of the options that I in terms of in 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 the short term that I I refer to they are uh, complementary and should be um, there are other options. They, they should be looked at in complementary ways and should be further explored. Uh, but the focus should be on, on their rapid and expedited implementation, um, ensuring low interest rates and their wider access. In the medium to long term, there is a clear case to work towards a more comprehensive solution to address sovereign debt challenges. In this regard, UNCTAD's proposal to establish a global debt authority and an independent credit rating agency deserves serious consideration. Um, another systemic problem in the debt architecture is the role of credit rating agencies, as they play a dominant role in determining a country's accessibility to the international credit market. Developing countries have to calculate the cost and benefits of joining initiatives like TSSI or Common Framework. Some countries are reluctant to avail these benefits for fear of the possible prospect of credit trading downgrades, which would negatively affect their reputation at the international capital market. 
restricting access to borrowing in commercial markets or raise debt servicing costs down the road. For these reasons, as of today, only three countries have opted to join the common framework. Another systemic issue is the criteria to determine eligibility for accessing concessional loan facility. Middle-income countries, many of which are among the hardest hit by the pandemic and also have crushing debt burden already, have no access to concessional loans because of their higher GDP GNI ranking. The wooden treatment of the middle-income countries during a time of unprecedented global crisis has rightfully drawn criticism from the MIC, the MICs themselves, academia and international institutions. There is therefore a need to establish a multi-dimensional criteria beyond GNP, uh, GDP ranking to determine eligibility to access um, concessional loans. Um, so, so some of these uh, options can also, uh, if looked at and, and, and implemented, can address immediate liquidity needs and also longer term financing requirements, um, especially with regards to SDGs. Uh, now a few words on ODA and uh, other aspects. So. The official development assistance providers, um, I think, should scale up and meet their ODA commitments uh, with a greater volume of grants. And this should be uh, considered as an immediate priority. The financing gap of access to COVID-19 tools accelerator uh, needs to be closed. Uh, additional support for Ukraine and refugees must not come at the expense of cross-border ODA flows to other countries in need. Um, there is this issue of illicit financial flows. Um, as we know, these flows are, their origins lie in tax abuse, cross-border corruption, transnational financial crime, but more to the point that cumulatively and individually, these flows drain resources from achievement of uh, sustainable development. And there is enough evidence to, to point that these flows also worsen inequalities, fuel, in, fuel instability, undermine governance and damage public trust. Ultimately, they contribute to states not being able to fulfill their development right as a basic human right. Um, estimates by UNCTAD suggest that revenue losses caused by tax motivated illicit financial flows alone are in the range of between 49 to $193 billion. So I have, uh, I, the, these flows are a systemic problem again, requiring a systemic solution. A web of existing international instruments and institutions has grown organically over time, responding to a wide variety of interests in the fields of tax cooperation, anti-money laundering and anti-corruption. Yet they leave gaps around inclusion, implementation and enforcement. Moreover, there is no single body tasked with global coordination, allowing incoherence and duplication. An entire ecosystem approach is perhaps needed to address the shortcomings of the present patchwork of structures and adapt them to ever evolving risks. We know that FACTI panel uh, has made some practical and implementable recommendations, and we think UNCTAD uh, may take forward some of these proposals. For instance, um, the, in terms of creation of a multilateral mediation mechanism to fairly assist countries in resolving difficulties on international asset recovery and return and to strengthen compensation ability. Promote exchange of information internationally among law enforcement, customs and other authorities. 
and also in terms of creating an international compact on implementing financial integrity for sustainable development to coordinate capacity building. Uh, and also perhaps in terms of extending existing capacity building uh, in areas such as tackling of tax abuse, corruption, money laundering, financial crime, and asset recovery. A few words on, on the taxation architecture, the international taxation ar uh, architecture. According to recent estimates, the global loss to governments from profit shifting by international multinational enterprises is between 500 to 600 billion dollars, US dollars a year. International tax norms, particularly giving tax, taxing rights to developing countries on the basis of their jurisdiction, should be set out through an open and inclusive legal instrument with universal participation. And UNCTAD can provide assistance to developing countries to enab enable them to participate in the ongoing negotiation that OECD. Just a few words on climate finance. There is, of course, is the continuing need to enhance climate finance, in particular, uh, adaptation uh, finance to prioritize uh, grant finance for developing countries, especially those which are vulnerable to adverse impacts of climate change. Uh, the developed countries should mobilize 100 billion US dollars of climate finance per year uh, through to 2030. Uh, this is in accordance with their commitments that they undertook under the Paris Agreement. And climate finance should address specific needs, circumstances, and priorities of developing countries as provided for in the Paris Agreement in line with the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. And UNCTAD can lend support to expand the use of debt for climate swaps so these DFC swaps can reduce the level of in indebtedness as well as free up fiscal resources to be spent on green investments. Um, just a few words on medium term actions to reduce borrowing, borrowing costs and address fiscal pressures. Actions are needed at all levels. So global and national efforts are required to reduce borrowing cost and volatility from commercial sources and blended finance can reduce borrowing costs, but needs to focus on where it can add value with minimum concessionality to avoid diverting resources from social needs. In the medium term also, debt overhangs need, need to be addressed with the, with the objective to reduce debt burdens and to free up resources for investment in climate action and SDGs. Official debt swaps can create space for investments in economic recovery, SDGs, and climate action, particularly for countries that are fiscally constrained but do not have unsustainable debt burdens. Boosting domestic resource mobilization requires medium term planning, strong political will for implementation. Short and medium term actions can focus on tackling illicit financial outflows and broadening the tech space. Um, I know, but Richard, I, I have exceeded the time, but I have probably a minute left. So I would seek your indulgence and just focus last, my last point is on long-term solutions. And that speaks to a few points. One is, for instance, the reform of the global economic governance remains urgent, but, we know that progress in this area has been uneven. In the Addis Ababa agenda, member states committed to strengthening the voice of developing countries in international decision making and global economic governance. While the representation of developing countries in the financial institutions, regional development banks, and standard setting bodies has increased slightly between 2005 and 2015, Vote shares have remained largely constant since then, and major advanced economies continue to hold de facto veto powers in their decision making boards. Um, UNCTAD has made a proposal, uh, and uh, we certainly think that is something uh, that needs more uh, 
you know, political support, and that's in the, in the framework of uh, a multilateral framework for debt restructuring. Uh, the much expected reform of the international debt architecture has yet to commence. As I said earlier, UNCTAD has made a proposal for creation of an international debt authority. And that's something that uh, needs really uh, serious consideration. So <clears throat> these intersecting global crises that I mentioned are um, yet another reminder for early implementation of UN General Assembly Resolution 95 slash 2015, which called for establishment of a multilateral framework for sovereign debt restructuring. <clears throat> Temporary uh, liquidity boost is not uh, equivalent to systemic reform. Um, so what I mean by that is that the measures taken by international financial institutions and G20 so far have mostly been for liquidity provision on a temporary basis. They are not akin to, or they are not an alternative to systemic reform. And this is not to say that liquidity is not liquidity support is not important. Uh, alleviating debt service burden can increase and free up government any government's financial resources to meet exceptional balance of payment needs caused by the pandemic, so that crisis struck countries are enabled to focus on containing um, containing them and minimizing their negative impacts. SDG target eight. A calls for increased aid for trade support for developing countries. The objective of the initiative is, of course, is to help these countries build their supply side capacity and trade related infrastructure. They need to implement and benefit from WTO agreements and to expand, expand their trade. This is uh, another area where uh, UNCTAD uh, can uh, look at. Um, so my final words, uh, without international support and action, eradication of poverty and achievement of SDGs uh, will certainly be uh, remain out of reach. Policy actions in the areas uh, such as international trade, international finance, international taxation, and even investment are needed urgently. These widening gaps, both domestic and international, are also a reminder that underlying conditions, if left in place, will make resilience and growth luxuries enjoyed by a fewer and privileged people alone. And the world, the world can ill afford such outcomes that may leave millions further behind and exacerbate social tensions and, and unrest. So thank you very much, Richard, over to you. Emil, thank you very much uh, for that very comprehensive account of the challenges we face. I, I, I mean, in, in a nutshell, I think we have a, essentially we have a system that delivers too little too late across a whole s series of fronts. And what, what we need is a system that will deliver much more, much sooner. And I think that's very much the um, inspiration behind the project. That, that we're discussing today. So, let, and with that in mind, let me move swiftly on to uh, Penelope Hawkins, who was the leader of the of the project and is a senior economist in our debt and development uh, finance branch here in UNCTAD. So, Penelope, if you can give us a overview of the project and and some of its most important uh, findings. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, and thank you very much, um, Ambassador Hashmi, for what was um, an exceptionally um, expansive and helpful keynote address. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, if you just bear with me for one minute. Um, and start a presentation. Um, I take it you can see it. Um, somebody will <laughs> stop me if you can't. Um, so allow me to um, introduce this project. 
It's entitled Response and Recovery, Mobilizing Finance for Development in the Era of COVID. It's a development account project uh, that UNCTAD has led, but undertaken with the um, exceptional support and responsiveness um, of several regional commissions. I want to just take a minute for you to look at this screen. Um, this was in fact a, a, a graphic for the project that has been designed for us. The idea behind it, this world hopefully rising above the COVID uh, virus um, and hopefully um, moving on to new things. Um, of course, as I've mentioned before, what was is essential and has in fact been uh, for all of us, I think a very positive partnership has been the contribution of the Economic Commission for Africa, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, and the Economic Commission, social, the Economic and Social Commission um, for Asia Pacific. The project is primarily linked with SDG 17. Um, and in particular with three areas. First of all, the aim to strengthen domestic resource mobilization, including through international support for developing countries, to improve domestic capacity for cat tax and other revenue collection. Also to mobilize additional financial resources for developing countries from multiple sources, and then to assist developing countries in attaining long-term debt sustainability through coordinated policies aimed at fostering debt financing, debt relief and restructuring, and as appropriate um, to address the external debt of highly indebted poor countries to reduce debt distress. So it's in that framing that this project came about. The project was the brainchild of the development account uh, team in New York. Um, they immediately called for something to happen on the onset of the pandemic. And this project has um, effectively been in play since May, May 2020. It of course is uh, very much situated in this process of financing for development. And to that end, I think Ambassador Hashmi gave us really a primer on financing for development, covering all the different areas of finance, what has become to known as financing for development. The scope of the project was in turn very broad. So we did look at aspects of official development financing, although we didn't look at official development assistance, we did look at the role of multilateral development banks. We did look at international private capital flows. We looked at the mobilization of domestic public and private resources. And we looked at regional and global cooperation, particularly related to regional development banks and regional reserve systems. Moreover, we examined a whole range of channels and mechanisms for mobilizing. So we looked at grants and concessional loans, and of course, SDRs as a separate category, non-concessional debt financing. We looked at reserve management and a wide range of innovative financing, financing instruments. We could not have done this scope or range um, without the um, immense and cooperative assistance um, of the regional partners. We developed this project around a number of work streams. And the first of the work streams really was kind of diagnostic, a kind of a taking stock. And the aim for this process was to examine the macrofinancial need assessments um, following the COVID-19 shock. And the key part of this from the UNCTAD contribution was the global policy model, the extension of the global policy model to include more emerging market and middle income countries, and then the application of that model on the challenges of development trajectories, uh, structural transformation, the achievement of carbon neutrality, and then three country studies um, on three African countries, one of which will be presented in the next session. Then we as an additional tool and a diagnostic process, we looked at the insurance that is available for countries in the short term, liquidity, if you like, access to liquidity. This was the Global Financial Safety Net Tracker. 
um, with the partners from the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University and Freya University Berlin. And this really is an extraordinary piece of work because it examines all of the possible access types of liquidity and access to liquidity for 193 countries. This doesn't exist anywhere else and is indeed a very useful tool. I would commend you to look at the tracker website for your country, you can examine what do you have access to and where you are comparable in your regional um, uh, country analysis. Then in addition, we developed a new generation financial conditions indicator. UNTAD has, and particularly the Data and Development Finance Branch has been looking at financial conditions indicators for some time. Um, but this was a new generation indicator with the idea being to try and provide the analysis utilized of, uh, utilizing the tools of big data analysis to provide um, early indicators for a group of countries based on their clustered diagnostics. Then the second area of work within the project and the next three uh, work streams focused on debt strategies and financing instruments. In the first instance, we developed a sustainable development finance assessment framework. This was especially designed to examine the pressures that uh, Ambassador Rushmi has so very eloquently set out of how developing countries need to deal not only with the huge demands of both internal and external debt, but also the structural transformation that is implicit in meeting the sustainable development goals. Now, we focused on the first four sustainable development goals in this process, but of course, um, we, um, uh, we are hoping that this can be extended um, to further applications. The next area of work that we focus on was revitalizing soft law and responsible sovereign lending and borrowing. This was really based on the uh, point of departure of the UNCTAD principles on the promotion of responsible sovereign lending and borrowing, which were publicly endorsed um, in 2012. However, to some extent, the trail of this work has gone cold, although in many ways it remains a hugely legitimate approach to examining and preventing some of the kind of debt playouts that we are currently engaged in in the world. We'll focus on this in a session later today, together with, uh, and also a separate session on sustainable development finance assessments. Then the third work stream that we had a look at was the innovative financing instruments um, and the FFD agenda. Now, this was a process that was uh, United Nations wide, um, that a process that was chaired by um, the, the presidents of Canada and Jamaica and effectively led to um, really innovative and consolidated thinking on how one actually deals with financing for development in the era of COVID. And this work stream, which was led by ECLAC, specifically um, attempted to examine some of the policy recommendations that came out of that FFD agenda. So the examination of special drawing rights, state contingent debt instruments, debt swaps, uh, multilateral funds, and then even a multilateral credit rating agency. The work in this stream will be presented tomorrow afternoon. Then we, the final area of work were the next set of work streams, which looked at macro prudential and fiscal policies to restore development. The first was to examine the issue of developing country capital account man management. This was really crucial as of course, it was immediately apparent in the onset of the, of the uh, COVID crisis, this massive capital flight out of developing countries. While of course, in some cases, this was restored later, we know that this simply sets the stage for further uh, capital flight again and again. And we have seen this kind of volatility moving into this space. And this work really examined not only countries in the Latin American and Caribbean region, although it was work that was led by ECLAC, it looked at uh, developing countries throughout the world on a regional basis and drew lessons from this process. This again will be 
covered in tomorrow afternoon sessions. Then there was a piece of work discussed uh, ranging around macro prudential agendas for middle income countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. This focused specifically on middle income countries, which as we know are facing some of the greatest fallout, not only from the COVID pandemic now, but the consequent um, crises that have resolved, uh, revolved out of the war of Ukraine and other such um, supply shocks. Then we examined strengthening of domestic resource mobilization after COVID. This was an air, uh, a work stream that was led by um, our colleagues at ECA. Um, the idea was to first of all establish a tax policy framework and then to apply it. And we have two countries featured um, in a session uh, tomorrow morning to discuss this. And then finally, balanced and inclusive fiscal policy packages, which was led by ESCAP, which addressed the needs of the most vulnerable um, Asian Pacific countries um, to undertake rapid assessments of the impact of the pandemic. So in this process, a framework was developed, the ESCAP uh, macroeconomic framework, which is indeed already in place, but was utilized for rapid assessments and then um, uh, subsequent beneficiary countries um, benefited from a full-on um, analysis, including Samoa, Pakistan, and Kyrgyzstan. What were the contributions of the project? I don't want to steal the thunder of all of the ses uh, sessions that are to come over the next two days, but I think it's worthwhile to just highlight some of the comments that we have received from uh, important individuals who have gained knowledge of the process while we have working, while we've been working for the past two years on this process. For example, um, uh, sorry, before I get to that, let me just highlight some of the, 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 the contributions that we feel we can put forward um, on the basis of this funding of the technical account. In the first instance, UNCTAD was able to expand its global policy model to cover an additional developing countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, allowing a coherent and up-to-date assessment of the impact of the global economic conditions on developing countries. And of course, importantly, having done this now, these countries will continue to be part of the global policy model. Secondly, um, we, it made possible the regular update of the global financial safety net tracker. Um, and the final update will be extended until June 2022, which will happen still within this month, allowing all UN member states to know their relative position in this global financial safety net and develop, negotiate, and possibly expand their crisis response liquidity options. It has also allowed country-specific technical assessments and assessment of taxation gaps um, to be supported to selected beneficiaries in Africa with the view to improve tax policy and foster domestic resource mobilization. It is also uh, allowed for beneficiary countries in the Asia Pacific region to receive a tailored analysis of policy packages to ensure sustainable recovery. And then finally, although these are not all of the contributions, um, it has also enabled countries from Latin America and the Caribbean to benefit from in-depth analysis of their macro prudential measures, measures compared with other frameworks in other regions. It's allowed countries to share lessons and experience on how to improve fiscal space during periods of crisis. We have been throughout this process peer reviewed. So there have been uh, reviewers on all of the tools that we present today. They have provided reports on what we have done. We have had um, peer review workshops. And so we would like to emphasize that this is work that indeed has benefited not only from uh, the consultants that have been uh, obviously gainfully employed and have provided exceptionally good work for us, but it's also throughout the process benefited from additional um, experts, stakeholders, and policymakers. For example, um, here is a quote about the Global Financial Safety Net tracker, tracker, which proved to be an essential resource for developing countries to gauge their ability to draw on a variety of options for liquidity finance. Another quote said that 
strengthening the oversight role of parliament with regards to public debt and public debt management is of critical importance. And the UNCLAD project on revitalizing and revisiting the principles of responsible sovereign lending and borrowing plays a key role in laying the foundations for enhanced oversight and accountability. The challenges imposed by capital flow liberation and the removal of capital flow management should not be underestimated. And indeed, the lesson of capital flow liberalization and the recurrent crisis in the periphery is a greater degree of public autonomy can only be regained by promoting accumulation in domestically denominated assets and curtailing capital flows in a more persistent way. Accepting the notion that prudential regulation and capital controls are required as a norm, not just in a period of crisis, should be the logical conclusion of this project. So that's just a few of some of the very positive uh, quotes that we've got that relate to feedback on the project. I'd also like you to, I really encourage you to visit our website. The address is here in the bottom of the screen, mobilizingdevfinance.org. You can see that the coverage of the project is really quite significant. The coverage of the project here actually excludes the Global Financial Safety Net Tracker. As I mentioned already, it covers 193 countries. And so in fact, the map would not even be interesting. Um, so please do visit the website and consider looking at the ways in which the project has dealt with each of the countries here on the map. I thank you very much for your time and I thank you for your continued participation for the next two days. Penelope, thank you uh, very much. And, and as you rightly pointed out, the strength of the project <clears throat> has come from collaborating with uh, other parts of the UN system and in particular the regional commissions. And so I'm gonna turn immediately and we are of course inevitably running a little late uh, to the contributions from, from the commissions uh, and, and to give their reflections on, on the work that has been done. And I'm, I'm going to start with uh, uh, Shuvajit Banerjee, who is the senior, a senior economic affairs officer in the uh, macroeconomic policy and financing for development division in ESCAP. Um, uh, to give Shuvajit, if you can give your reflections on, on, on the project and, 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 and how you see it possibly moving forward, given the circumstances that we all face. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, can you hear me? Right. Um, yeah, uh, I think, um, as Penelope pointed out, this is um, this project has not only contributed to um, to our target countries, but I mean, it's been a, it's been a very good example of uh, cooperation within the UN system, uh, the ability to work across regional commissions and and uh, the global uh, UN institutions. Uh, just to give some background on what we did in Asia. So our idea here was to really um, have quite a focused sort of, um, uh, sort of assistance to some of our member countries. And so uh, there, were, there were two stages to the process. One was to uh, conduct a rapid assessment of the impacts of COVID, which was sort of last year, a year ago. And then, uh, and then to offer analysis on how to recover appropriately from uh, from the crisis, uh, with with the focus being on the SDGs. Really, that while one uh, undertakes fiscal policies, uh, of course, clearly, uh, firstly to uh, reinvigorate growth, but uh, not look, losing sight of uh, the inclusive and sustainable nature of uh, that growth. So, really, all our our advice to governments have been along the lines of how one can uh, prioritize the SDGs in their fiscal policy, re um, recovery policies. And uh, as Penelope pointed out, what we've, um, what we've contributed really, our value added to governments has been a sort of macroeconomic model, which we've developed over the last two years, um, which allow governments to uh, analyze the fiscal impact of their policies uh, on the SDGs. Um, and that has proved to be a very effective tool, which has been very, uh, appreciated by the governments we worked it worked with. 
Uh, again, as Penelope pointed out, we've had targeted three countries in our in our work. Uh, and so I was very pleased to see the ambassador of Pakistan here because Pakistan has been quite a focus of our work. Um, Pakistan, Samoa and Kyrgyzstan have been the three countries. And for example, if I take the case, <coughs> case of Pakistan, uh, we've we've had a very um, strong response from the government, a very, very um, a lot of interest in taking the word for work forward. As you mentioned, uh, what's the next steps? And what the government has asked us for is for further training in the use of the macroeconomic model, not only for different ministries, but also uh, federal ministries and also provincial ministries. The idea uh, to, to bring it down to the provincial level. So um, even as part of the project next month, we're going to have a um, training session where uh, where we'll uh, train policymakers in the use of this tool and um, uh, how they can use it for uh, their own policy making. Um, again, in the case of Samoa, uh, we've been asked for the same as well. After we've had our initial dissemination of the project's results, the government has asked us to um, compare their our macroeconomic model with the one that the Ministry of Finance in Samoa has been using until now, and to have a sort of compare and contrast and. Um, and asking them to sort of, uh, you know, imp well, uh, improve or you, you know, uh, use this to buttress the the uh, modeling work that they've already undertaken. So again, we've uh, we found a lot of uh, feedback and interest coming out of this project uh, uh, from the government. Um, Richard, uh, probably those are some some of the key, um, you know, sort of. Uh, uh, highlights of um, of the work that ESCAP has done so far in the project. Sure, Richard, thank you very much. And uh, I mean, I, I just just to underscore, I think the the value of this kind of model of kind of collaboration at the macro level that then is then picked up through the commissions at the country level, I think is is something that's very very um, uh, 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 in a, not innovative, perhaps, but very very. Um, productive as a way in which the UN system can uh, contribute to meeting these kinds of challenges uh, on the ground. So, so thank, thanks very much uh, for, for the contribution. Let me now turn over to um, Hopestone Chavula, who is from the Macro and Governance Division of the Economic Commission for Africa in Addis, who again has been a, 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 a very um, central part of, of the collaborative nature of this project. So Hopestone, if you can give your reflections, please, on, 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 on the participation of ECA in this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to be part of this project. Um, in short, uh, ECA actually embarked African countries that recover from the COVID-19. And one of the areas uh, that we looked at uh, was uh, the, the country's tax regimes. Uh, so I identify opportunities and challenges okay. in the country's tax regimes. Okay, yes. I'm sorry to speak over you. I wonder if perhaps you could. Can you hear um, me? I can hear you, but it's very it's breaking up. Perhaps you could uh, just switch off the video, so we could just hear your voice. Okay. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I think that's better. Hello. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I will say that. Uh, uh, ECA impact on the uh, uh, strategies and the mechanisms that would help African countries uh, as the recurrent of our strategies was to look at uh, the tax regimes with the aim of identifying opportunities and challenges uh, that uh, could, uh, could uh, lead into designing mechanisms that could raise uh, the resource mobilization. Uh, 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 strategies. Uh, in that regard, the ECA embarked on uh, excise tax initially 
and uh, that was uh, done in uh, but uh, uh, from uh, that project it emanated that countries were more interested now in uh, the other component of the session system which were direct taxes and this is where this project came in very handy at that particular moment that's why the project embarked on assessing the tax regimes, the direct tax regimes in, in the different countries. And this project was basically directed towards that component so that we make the whole tax system complete. And uh, in that regard, in the phase of the project, actually it led to the uh, development of analytical framework uh, for the assessment of the uh, direct tax system. Uh, to look at uh, areas where countries could identify opportunities to raise or increase their revenue collection uh, so that uh, they are actually classify uh, or direct those revenues towards their development priorities. And uh, this analytical framework has been applied to three countries, Ethiopia, Zambia, uh, and Kenya, and uh, uh, the, the, the countries, two of the countries will make presentations tomorrow, as uh, my colleague Penelope has indicated. Uh, with regards to the way forward, what we have uh, learned from this is that um, uh, it is uh, very important and much more easier for countries to reorganize or, or, or reassess their tax regimes and identify opportunities without harming uh, the different components uh, of, of, of those affected by the tax regimes that are being implemented. And with this, this has become part and parcel of uh, the work of ECA going forward as we continue to receive requests from different countries. Uh, so both looking at the direct taxes and the excise taxes makes us capable to look at the whole tax regime uh, in the different countries as we receive requests from countries. And uh, the, 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 the institution has uh, taken hold of this. And uh, currently we are working on, a, on a, uh, applying these tools to countries such as Tanzania and uh, Sao Tome and Principe, which are our next target countries in this regard. So in terms of sustainability, the project has become part and parcel of the overall work of ECA at his, at his, as it has contributed significantly uh, to what uh, the institution has embarked on uh, with the aim of raising revenues for developmental purposes in the different countries. Uh, let me stop there, Richard. Thank you very much once again for the opportunity. It has also given us uh, uh, the opportunity to work with the different uh, UN regional commissions, which has been a, a, a great experience, and the sharing of ideas has have actually uh, personally also enhanced our view in terms of uh, the issues uh, that are affecting different countries globally. Thank you very much. Upstone, thank you very much, and, and clearly that uh, in, in continuity of that project and the question of domestic resource mobilization tax tax regimes is, is obviously a critical one that, that goes beyond the African content, uh, continent and is an is a important challenge that we, we need to invest more time in, I think, in terms of, of, of mobilizing resources meet the SDGs. So, so thank you. Thank you very much for for your contribution. The last contribution actually is uh, from Esteban Perez, who is the chief of the FFD unit at ECLAC. Um, needless to say, it is uh, five o'clock in the morning in Santiago, and we were not going to subject Esteban uh, to, to waking up so early, but he was kind enough to provide a video for us on on the ECLAC contribution. So we will play the video as a way of, of ending this uh, uh, this session, this, this first session of, of of today's seminar. So if someone can please um, play the, the video from Esteban. Good morning to everyone. 
My name is Esteban Perez Galdente, and I am the coordinator of the Financing for Development Unit within the Economic Development Division at the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. It has been a real pleasure and indeed learning experience to actively participate in this development account project response and recovery, mobilizing financial resources for development in the time of COVID-19, coordinated by UNCTAD in partnership with ECA, ECLAC, and ESCA. The development account project provided ECLAC with an opportunity to undertake research in three areas that are highly relevant to Latin America and the Caribbean's pandemic context, as well as to building forward better for a sustained recovery. These three areas include capital controls, macroprudential policies, and innovative financing instruments. The work on capital controls and macroprudential policies provided a regional comparative analysis that included 19 states across the Asia Pacific, Africa, and Latin American Caribbean regions. These representative case studies serve to illustrate the objectives and modalities guiding capital flow regulations and macroprudential policies. They provided a basis on which to draw important policy lessons and guidelines regarding the feasibility and effectiveness of capital controls for different regions, for different countries, and under different circumstances underscoring the fact that the evolution of economies is an historically contingent process. The work on macroprudential policies led to the development of an economic model for Latin America to analyze the impact of different macroprudential policies. And the model is currently used as part of an ECLAC technical assistance requested by the government of Honduras. And we hope to present to the government of Honduras the results of the model during the month of August. The research work undertaken on innovative financing instrument was used as an input for the ECLAC brief and innovative financing for development agenda for the recovery in Latin America and the Caribbean which was presented on the 3rd of December at the United Nations headquarters to the permanent missions of Latin American and Caribbean countries. An earlier version was circulated at the request of the Costa Rican government at the sixth summit of heads of state and government of the community of Latin America and Caribbean states held in Mexico City from the 17th to the 18th of September 2000. 21. Thank you very much. Thanks, Esteban, for that um, for that video. I, I'm not I'm not going to try and summarize what has what what has been said uh, uh, this morning. I think I think I, at least I hope it's been a taster for what is to come in the subsequent sessions and to give a sense also of the way in which we went about this project as a, as a, as a genuinely collaborative effort um, uh, for a problem that all developing countries are, are facing. So, so I hope, I hope that, uh, that has provided a useful starter for the, the, the seminar that will take place over the next uh, couple of days. Um, and I, I look forward certainly to the, the next sessions. I would, I, would I would suggest that given that we are running a little bit late, I would suggest we take a break for 10 minutes and then, and then we will come back to the final session of the morning. I think Penelope, you will be, you will be um, hosting uh, that session. So, if that works for you, that seems the best way to go. Thank you very much, Richard. I really appreciate that. Um, the next session will be um, a round table that will be moderated and chaired by Stephanie Blankenberg. Um, but it's going to be um, one in which I really hope we are able to just pour um, our knowledge on some of the impact, the response and recovery of specific areas sometimes countries, sometimes areas like human rights, and how that has been um, indeed an exceptional shock, shock for the world. So if we can all just be back here by um, 11.30, please be prompt, and we'll set out for the next session. Thank you, Richard. Bye-bye. Thanks to everyone for participating. Yes, yeah, sorry. And if I may just say, this 
Um, this link will remain the same link for you to have access to the room throughout the next two days. Um, so if at any stage you need to move out and you are able to come back in, please just use the same Zoom link. Thank you very much.
Hi, Stephanie. Yes, hello, everybody. So we're moving now to um, the um, roundtable discussion on sharing country experiences in uh, response um, to the pandemic and in terms of their um, uh, recovery from the pandemic. Um, we have a reasonable time for this. Now, uh, the point of this roundtable discussion in particular is to uh, um, continue from the, uh, from the opening panel that has highlighted the um, importance in particular of putting developing, developing country needs uh, center stage of this project and on key findings and recommendations through the following two um, avenues. First, um, to share country experiences of the pandemic and of challenges posed by addressing its impact. Um, the two country uh, experience that we will share here is uh, one Sri Lanka and B Kenya in particular. Uh, but also to highlight cross-cutting issues um, in uh, experiences um, of impact and uh, informing responses to this, uh, again, in two areas. One is um, uh, um, human rights issues and the second um, gender issues. Now we have four uh, eminent participants for this round table. They will begin with short 10 minute initial interventions and we will then move to a general debate uh, by both roundtable and uh, um, uh, wider uh, participants from the floor. Um, in this regard, I would just uh, uh, like to point out to you that um, following the, the initial interventions by the um, <clears throat> uh, um, roundtable participants, um, you can just simply raise your hand. I will see that and or you can uh, put questions in the chat. Um, that I will uh, be monitoring. So uh, allow me now to begin with our first roundtable participant, um, who is uh, Excellency Ambassador uh, Mrs. Gothami Silva of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka. Ambassador Silva's distinguished diplomatic career spans well over three decades, culminating for now in her appointment as the first female ambassador and permanent representative of Sri Lanka to the World Trade Organization in 2019. She is a highly regarded expert on multi and bilateral trade and investment negotiations and relations with her expertise extending amongst other areas to uh, trade related aspects also of labor and environment issues. Uh, today, Ambassador Silva will speak to us uh, on Sri Lanka's experience of the pandemic and possible routes to recovery. Ambassador, we're very honored and very pleased to have you with us today. Uh, may I please pass the word to you? Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Stephanie. Uh, glad to see you after uh, a long time and thank you uh, again. Uh, first, uh, let me express my sincere appreciation uh, to the entire team. Uh, for this timely event and inviting Sri Lanka to share its experiences uh, on response to and recovery from the pandemic at this roundtable discussion. I hope I'm uh, clear and louder, uh, uh, louder, clear and louder. Uh, so as uh, alluded uh, to uh, by today uh, by Richard and Ambassador Hashimi in their opening remarks today, uh, the fragilities of developing countries are not going away and they are soon. And its sustainability is a key uh, is a key fragility. Debt of all uh, types uh, reached record levels during the pandemic in both advanced economies and emerging market and developing economies. The impact of the COVID, uh, the Russia Ukraine war, and the monetary tightening by developed countries uh, accentuate vulnerabilities in developing countries as they have less policy space and less access to external support. In 2020, uh, during the first year of the pandemic, uh, 62 countries uh, had no alternative but to allocate more resources to debt services uh, than to uh, either public health care or education, uh, which is quite uh, uh, a challenging uh, decisions to make. Unfortunately, Sri Lanka was among uh, this kind of developing countries which are facing multiple crises at once. Uh, 
So let me take you through some of these challenges that uh, we, uh, Sri Lanka, wishes to share with uh, the international community. First, the COVID-19. It has imposed new government spending, but eroded tax revenues, uh, leading to a worst debt situation. And as you may witness now, it is a very serious situation. It is not a coincidence that Sri Lanka's debt to GDP increased to 101% and the budget deficit increased to around 11.1% in 2020. Moreover, the COVID impacted important foreign exchange uh, foreign currency revenues. While in 2019, the country received almost US dollar 4 billion from tourism in 2020, it decreased to less than 1 billion which is a, a very serious situation. And we are still trying to comprehend with uh, this loss of revenue in tourism. Remittances have also halved between 2019 and 2020. The second uh, the sit situation, the Russia-Ukraine war thre threatens to add to, the more, uh, add to the problem. It is already severely disrupting food, energy, and financial markets. According to the United Nations, food, uh, FAO, uh, food prices are 34% higher than this time last year and have, have never been uh, since high since FAO uh, started recording them. Similarly, crude oil prices have increased by around 60% and gas and fertilizer prices have also uh, have uh, more than uh, doubled. The increase in prices of key international products and finance will create further pressure on government spending and worse balance of payment conditions. The third point is the monetary, monetary tightening by developed countries initiated by the, initiated by the United States Federal Reserve uh, recently will likely trigger uh, a flight for safety. For developing countries and Sri Lanka, it will make external borrowing from commercial service, uh, sources even more difficult. Although the SDR allocation of 650 billion US dollars in August uh, 2021 is welcome, most of the resources were allocated to countries that do, do not have external constraints. While 150 developing countries received 242 uh, billion dollars, Sri Lanka received only 787 million, dollar, million dollars. Moreover, has it been received earlier at the beginning of the pandemic, more of the downside risks uh, to countries like mine could have been averted. The pandemic also provided an opportunity for Sri Lanka to revive and strengthen its domestic agricultural production system, social protection programs to help its citizens recover more quickly from future shocks. Domestic agricultural production systems include home gardening system, augmenting domestic production for food security purpose, and social protection uh, includes social assistance, social insurance, and programs to enhance opportunities to help people find better jobs. Sri Lanka has many challenges ahead. The country needs to perceive necessary structural changes, promote development and achieve sustainable development goals. But at the moment, our possibilities are being restricted by external financial constraints, such as COVID-19, the war in Ukraine, and further actions weighted by monetary tightening in developing developed countries. As you are aware, the government has already sought the assistance from the IMF and the World Bank, in addition to seeking increased bilateral loan arrangements and debt write-offs. The IMF team has, has constructive and productive discussions with the Sri Lankan authorities on economic policies and reforms to be supported by the IMF extended fund facility arrangement. The objective of this new IMF support program would, would be to restore microeconomic stability and debt sustainability while protecting the poor and vulnerable, safeguarding financial stability and stepping up structural reforms to address corruption vulnerabilities and unlock Sri Lanka's tough policy shifts 
that will not be popular among the Sri Lankan population. There are apprehension that Sri Lanka will call to make the central bank the, the financial, uh, the, the leading uh, agency, independent, a strong anti-corruption measures and promotion of the rule of law. And it is echoed that without these critical reforms, Sri Lanka may suffer for the economic management and uncontrollable debt. In conclusion, Sri Lanka's fiscal deficit and high debt levels limit its ability to use social expenditure to cushion the effect of a COVID-19 recession on household. It is a widening gap between revenue and expenditure. To address this, government is normally over as to how uh, the other tax, uh, domestic tax income, income could be enhanced by bring, bringing major reforms to its domestic tax base, in, including uh, the taxation of digital, digitalized companies. Other as aspects such as low international ratings agency assessments have also increased the cost of further borrowing, limiting Sri Lanka's ability to raise foreign borrowings. In this backdrop, Sri Lanka welcomes the UNCTAD Sustainable Development Finance Assessment Report as it brings new perspective to how the challenges faced by Sri Lanka. This report plays a reality. While analyzing debt sustainability, UNCTAD SDA takes as a point of departure uh, resource needed to achieve SDGs four, one to four and its impact on public debt sustainability. Moreover, it encompasses uh, all type of external financing, be it external debt, foreign direct and portfolio investments and all sorts of foreign currency revenues, exports and remittances, and assess debt sustainability. We highly welcome uh, it as a tool to diagnose external financial and public debt vulnerabilities, and most importantly, design debt strategies. Sri Lanka therefore encourage many other developing countries and LDCs to approach UNCTAD team to obtain this kind of comprehensive and well-researched technical expertise in addressing the recurring debt crisis and debt sustainability. I'll be very happy to uh, take questions if there are uh, during this panel discussion. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, Ambassador, Ambassador, thank you very, very much. Um, we will surely come back uh, on a number of issues um, that you has, have raised. Um, pertaining in particular um, to Sri Lanka and um, your government's view uh, on um, the main challenges that you face and, and the ways in which um, Angtad, um through this project and uh, uh, more widely uh, uh, can possibly assist. Um, in the meanwhile, allow me now um, to move on to um, uh, Professor Atia Waris who is currently uh, the UN independent expert on foreign debt, other international financial obligations and human rights. Uh, professor Varis is also the only professor of fiscal law and policy in Eastern Central Africa, uh, the only female, I should say, professor, and the first female director of research and enterprise at the University of Nairobi, and uh, finally also an observer to the UN Tax Committee. Her research and wider professional experience of over 20 years has been pioneering in linking the areas of tax and human rights and in mapping out African fiscal systems and has uh, more generally focused on tax issues, illicit financial flows, tax justice and human rights at both global as well as specific regional levels. Uh, Professor Varis will today speak to us about the impact of the pa pandemic on human rights, uh, primarily uh, from a global perspective in uh, accordance with her current role. Professor Varis, uh, may I welcome you very warmly to this uh, roundtable. We are very uh, grateful for having you and let me pass on uh, the floor to you without further ado. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie, and thank you for the very kind introduction. Just to say, I'm not the first female professor. I'm the first, the first professor. professor. Okay, I wasn't yes. entirely sure whether I missed out on that bit or not. But yes, I, I, uh, 
I have that, taken it. No, you got it. <laughs> the first time round. Sure. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and I follow the work of Amtad very closely and you do excellent work on a number of issues. My, my particular conversation, which I am hoping to add to today, is about the issue of uh, resources and rights, specifically the fact that resources are for a particular purpose. And very often, when, uh, when we look at the issues around rights, or we look at the issue around resources, we sometimes forget or lose sight of the fact that we are collecting the resources for a particular purpose. And then the question becomes, what is that purpose? So from my perspective, when we look at issues around foreign debt, international financial obligations, which is my mandate, but also the issues broadly of resources, um, the most critical Professor part Horace, of you are, the you are, resource you, you is... You are sometimes the, breaking yes? up, excuse me for interrupting okay. you, but you're, you're breaking up a little. And again, okay. uh, it may be perhaps an option that you switch off the video so we can hear you. I will hear do that. Yeah, that you stay close to your mic. Okay, thank will you. you. I, I hope this is better now. Yeah, I think so. Okay, Thanks. super. All right, my apologies. My Kenya network is not as strong as it should be this uh, this morning. Uh, so, so when we look at issues around rights and resources, for me, this is really the center focus of it. So when we are collecting resources, why are we collecting them? And what are we going to use them for? And then if I come around to how we collect the resources, from whom are we collecting them? becomes also critical. So when we look at all of these resources, whether it is foreign debt or it's domestic debt, whether it is a public creditor or a private creditor, or if we're looking at issues that are illicit financial flows, and this is where for me the issue of human rights becomes absolutely critical. So human rights is a really good measure that one can look at to bring, uh, to bring revenue into focus and to start to place it in such a way that we are never taking from those who cannot afford to give and we are taking it with kindness. So um, principles of fiscal legitimacy for me become critical. Issues around transparency, responsibility and accountability, effectiveness and efficiency. And then this broad basket which brings in human rights at such a important level, issue of fairness and justice, not only in the collection and the spending. And so if I look at the work that not only Antad has been doing, but also as said by Kotani, that we have numerous crises and it's placing countries in a position of almost a confluence of these multiple crises, which makes it a very difficult situation for many countries and of course, least develop, developing countries are amongst the most hardest hit. In uh, 2021, the report on global financial safety nets and special drawing rights that was developed by the Debt and Development Finance Branch of UNCTAD actually looked at the shortcomings in the current international financial architecture with specific focus on the insufficiency of affordable long-term financing. And this is something that is Lawati, I think you are. You have just broken up. I don't. Okay, my back now. Yeah, you're, you back. you're back. Now. You're okay, back now. Am I back? back? Yeah, oh, you yes. just sort of were Apologies looking at for that. Uh, uh, at work at Antad about um, the insufficiency of affordable yes uh, financing, external financing. Thank you. So the the insufficiency of affordable long long time financing to enable structural transformation, both for LDCs and middle in income countries, is really critical. And the fact that we are now moving into a stage of the COVID nineteen crisis and the major roadblock is not only economic response but also the country's ability to recover, that becomes quite critical. And if I reflect on the 2022 Financing for Development report, middle income countries and low income countries need 751 billion to 351 billion dollars 
simply for the social protection financing gap. So when we are looking at the resources we need, and then we're looking at what is the most critical or crucial requirements, these figures are, are really important. But it also, I would add my point to the fact that this particular report actually urgently asks that this rising financial gaps be actually um, coordinated to allow for fair tax governance. Um, I would like to also refer to a report that I'm currently developing, which will be presented at the General Assembly 77 session in the third committee, where I'm actually going to be looking at the issue of the international tax governance which is central as many countries, especially the low and middle income countries are actually facing cumulative dangers of high debt related distress, illicit financial flows and severe socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic. Have you lost me again? Are we okay? No, you're fine, Stephanie. You're fine. Okay. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> I'm watching you very carefully. <laughs> All right. So um, one of the main tools, which is my my, my annual resolution 46.8 for um, 2021 and 49.15 of 2022, have actually recalled that the sovereign rate right of any state to restructure debt and recognize the impact of illicit financial flows, including tax avoid avoidance and evasion by transnational corporations, means that countries are being forced to rely on external borrowing due to lack of resources. And a previous mandate holders report on their country visit to Sri Lanka in 2019 also highlighted the strategy chosen by the government of Sri Lanka upon the recommendation of the IMF to stabilize the economy. And this was by strengthening fiscal and external sectors via external indebtedness. So the issue of tackling illicit financial flows and asset recovery which is also a guideline the Human Rights Council has asked me to provide a report on for March of next year. And there is a deadline to this call for August uh, 15, adds to this particular topic. So I, I, I hope you were able to follow. So just to briefly recap, debt is crucial, resources are crucial, but we need them for a reason. And the reason is showing itself constantly and consistently. However, in addition to debt, which is crucial, we also need to look at issues of illicit financial flows, and we need a robust from every angle, and issues around international cooperation and assistance, which are extremely important, both on issues of foreign debt and issues of illicit financial flows, need to be made as robust as possible and developed as much as possible. I would like to stop by just mentioning that I have been communicating with both the IMF as well as the OECD, the G20, the G77, as well as the EU on the diverse actions they have been taking from as diverse topics as gender strategies and how this works. Uh, and on the other hand, on issues of digital taxation and the digital economy, and how to ensure that adequate resources are made available for all countries globally in a fair and just way. I thank you very much. I apologize for the poor connection uh, this morning and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Ajay, um, uh, for this contribution. Um, this broke up a little bit in the middle, but I think we all uh, uh, got your, mind, your main message very clearly and we'll, uh, uh, I hopefully come back to this in the um, in the uh, um, open discussion. In the meanwhile, um, I would like to um, move on to our third uh, contributor, Professor Alemaye Ugeda. Um, professor Geda uh, is professor of economics at the University of Addis Ababa and also research associate at the School of Oriental and African Studies uh, in London. His extensive research experience and collaboration span several UN agencies, the World Bank regional research consortia, such as the Kenyan Institute for Public Policy Research and the African Economic Research Consortium, um, as well as government advisory position, in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa. Professor Gida has widely published on the Ethiopian economy, African economies more general, international uh, development, policy issues and applied macroeconomics. 
Professor Gida also collaborated with us uh, on this project with a very interesting background study on the macroeconomic and social impact of COVID-19 in Kenya, about uh, which he will now speak to us. Uh, Professor Gida, we very and especially pleased um, that you have been able to join us on this occasion uh, to, to discuss your uh, very important own contribution um, to the project. Uh, may I pass uh, the word to you, please, Professor Giddon. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for giving the opportunity uh, to present uh, briefly what I did with within this project. And in this project context, we did we did actually uh, three background studies: one <clears throat> on Zambia, another on Ethiopia, and the other on Kenya. And uh, for the, for the sake of time, I'll try briefly summarize uh, also the others, the others together. Okay. Uh, and basically what we tried to do was to see what was the impact of uh, the macroeconomic impact of uh, the pandemic uh, on, on, on these uh, countries. Some of these countries are quite, quite uh, diverse in the sense that <clears throat> Uh, Kenya is quite a diverse economy, a well-developed financial system, uh, one of probably the best economy, uh, economies that we have in sub-Saharan Africa. And if you take Zambia, Zambia is also a very good economy, but extremely dependent on, on copper. And so probably represent some the mineral dependent economies. And Ethiopia is basically resource poor, conflict prone, and uh, very, uh, big country in terms of population. So we tr we tried to see in this project different uh, sample of countries and what is the, the general macroeconomic impact on these uh, countries. Generally what we observed was that the all countries, most of the countries had been ridden by physical challenges before the pandemic, uh, such as growing level of debt, uh, uh, physical uh, narrowed fiscal space, and therefore the COVID effect was aggravated the indebtedness uh, as well as, as, well as uh, the physical space of uh, many countries. Macroeconomic instability persisted uh, following the COVID. Inflation in, in Ethiopia, in Zambia, in Kenya uh, has increased significantly. Currency depreciated uh, significantly. So macroeconomic stability persisted uh, in, all, in all the uh, case study countries. In all, also we witnessed the inability to carry, to carry domestic uh, demand stimulus uh, for recovery uh, as, as can be done in global north. In global, in global north, uh, as, as you remember, everybody was uh, having this stimulus package. Uh, in Africa, almost all countries have tried that, but the resource they have in their hand was, was very limited. So their macroeconomic condition was uh, the, the imp for instance, if you see uh, in terms of since COVID-19 uh, pandemic began in early 20, governments have announced fiscal stimulus package ranging in the cost from 2% uh, of the GDP in South Sudan to about 10% of the GDP in South Africa. So there, there is a range, a big range, and this is basically determined by the, the fiscal capacity of uh, the countries. So countries generally were in a dilemma uh, that on the one hand, they need resources uh, uh, to recover from the, the pandemic. On the other hand, they don't have, they have limited fiscal space even before COVID. Therefore, if they went further, there is a huge possibility of macroeconomic instability. So, there were almost all governments were caught up with this with this with this dilemma, and uh, despite all this, you know, the pandemic on the average in the continent has reduced GDP by two percent. Kenya relatively performed better because the, the you know the reduction in GDP was zero, almost zero. Uh, we can say so compared to the country, the Kenyan performance was uh, relatively good, and. It, this is primarily helped by the uh, the lesser effect of the pandemic on the on the manufacturing and the agricultural sectors. The service sector in all places has been hurt so much, but the agri agriculture grew significantly in Kenya during this time, 
and the manufacturing almost opened during this time. So this has helped uh, to recover better than the other countries. In all, we have uh, this serious macroeconomic uh, stability and you know, the IMF has provided uh, some funding, uh, uh, some SDR for African countries. And uh, from the studies, we learned that this amount is extremely small. Almost all of the fund has been used to boost up their reserves, their reserves, and almost all countries expressed that in Eastern African countries, about I reviewed about 14 countries, almost all uh, revealed that this help was extremely small, uh, but it was helpful at least it helped them to, to increase their reserves. And now this is aggra aggravated by you know the, the impact of the Ukraine, uh, Russia war, uh, conflict, uh, because most African countries, in particular in eastern part of the continent, are dependent on wheat import from these countries. Uh, most of them are oil importers, and the fertilizer price has skyrocketed. And most of them are trading also with European countries. Uh, they are the most important trading partners of the continent, and the European countries uh, uh, themselves have encountered huge cost increase in their activities. So that has impacted uh, the company. Now, coming to the social, to tell you the, briefly the social uh, impact from the three case studies done on, in the context of this project, generally all firms that we reviewed uh, uh, suffered, but the brunt of the cost of the pandemic has fallen on small and micro firms who were severely affected by the pandemic than large and medium-sized firms. The pandemic disproportionately affected businesses with a large share of female employees. So, you know, the gender, the gender impact, is, the, the, the COVID impact was seriously has a gender bias because it disproportionately affected businesses with a large share of female employees. For instance, the number of food insecure, uh, uh, medium and small scale enterprise householders, which was just 14% uh, before the pandemic in Kenya, has dramatically increased to 61% uh, uh, in 2020. Uh, the majority of agricultural and manufacturing firms have been able to remain open. Within, within the service sector, there are large differences in operating stats of firms in all of the cases. The study in, in the case study countries, the service sector and the sector with strong linkage to the global economy has been hurt a lot and all employees in those sectors suffered. In all countries, poverty has increased. The poverty effect of the pandemic was severe across the continent and also in the three uh, case study countries. So the, the conclusion I came up we came up with uh, from this uh, is that the challenge of recovery will be will became enormous in particular fiscal space uh, and macroeconomic stability was looming in most countries. The import this shows the importance of external uh, uh, resources and market access with stable and rising commodity prices will be important for recovery. This is the case because Zambia would have suffered a lot had it not been for a continuous increase in the copper prices. But fortunately for Zambia, uh, the commodity price was good during the, the pandemic period and it relatively performed well, but it would have been much worse had it not been for that. So the importance of the global recovery for Africa is important, uh, but the importance of uh, mobilizing resources and uh, handling uh, the debt burden that followed both domestic debt and external debt significantly increased in Kenya following the pandemic. Even right now we're speaking in Kenya shortage of serious foreign exchange, uh, 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 foreign exchange that reserves. Therefore, this shows clearly that the pandemic has serious macroeconomic ramification that requires uh, that requires a global a global uh, solution. It cannot be handled simply by individual countries and in the continent. That's pretty much what I have. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Geda, for this um, very interesting uh, contribution and also, of course, for the 
uh, background uh, uh, paper that you provided uh, for this project and that is um, available for anyone interested to uh, look at the detail. Now our final uh, roundtable panelist um, is uh, Professor Valer uh, Valeria Esquivel. Um, uh, Professor Esquivel, you um, uh, allow me to welcome you very warmly. Um, Professor Esquivel is Employment Policies and Gender Specialist at the ILO and also a member of the International Association of Feminists. Uh, prior to joining the ILO, she was a research co coordinator on gender and development at the UN uh, Research Institute for Social Development, UNRIST. And uh, uh, there, her research focused primarily on the care economy and on care policies. Beyond her roles uh, in the UN, Professor Esquivel has a, a long-standing academic uh, career as a feminist economist, uh, publishing extensively on labor, macroeconomic, and social policies. Um, welcome uh, uh, very warmly again, Professor Esquivel, uh, and uh, I believe you will now uh, speak to us about the impact of the pandemic from the, from the perspective in particular uh, or, on of gender issues. Um, may I hand? Yes, uh, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for the presentation and for um, and and for the invitation. Uh, and I I wish to present. I hope uh, Marina can can put uh, the slides I prepare. I wish to present the um, several um, employment diagnostics or the diagnostics uh, we made at the ILO along the crisis, and what that tells or that uh, teaches uh, with regards to uh, both the gender um, reading of the crisis and also gender responsive uh, macroeconomic and employment policies in general. Um, Marina, could you share? This is Geddes uh, whiteboard. Okay, perhaps I can, I, I can. Um, uh, one um, second, I'm trying to see uh, whether I can share it. Uh, <laughs> but the, the one, Stephanie, you have is, is, is a previous version, so right. I hope. Marina. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, there she is. There she is. Sorry, yeah. I, I know I had a version in the um, in the email. Yes. Uh, okay. But let me uh, let me yeah. So I will share in one second. Sorry, I had an emergency call just now. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very very much. I will. Uh, yeah. Yes. So uh, I hope. I, I will have nine minutes from now uh, because uh, I, I prepare uh, um, kind of three sections of this presentation and I would move forward as fast as I can. Um, so if you can move to the next uh, um, slide. Uh, one thing that in this crisis happened and it was unprecedented is not only the um, degree of job losses, uh, several times uh, bigger than the Great Recession in 2008-9, but the fact that uh, the job losses have hit women hardest and they are lagging behind in the recovery. So to give you a rough estimate um, uh, in, in uh, or a global estimate, not rough, uh, women lost 46 million jobs uh, in 2020 and men lost 57 million, but in percentage terms, and we know women are less uh, uh, active in the labor markets, this was 3.6% uh, of all women employed compared to 2.9%. And uh, even if employment recovered both for women and for men during 2021, uh, the recovery was slower uh, for 
for women. Um, and uh, by the end of 2021, uh, women's jobs were uh, approximately 19 million fewer than in 2019. And this uh, figure was 10.2 million for men. The following one, Marina, I think, I believe you need to um, uh, my, uh, mute your mic. Uh, when, uh, when seen as employment to population ratios, uh, we also seen, uh, see that uh, they are not projected to recover uh, for any income level uh, country grouping in 2022, but because women will recover less uh, than um, than uh, men, uh, the gaps, the gaps are going to be um, to to man, to be uh, maintained, if you want. Um, it's it's only in in high income countries that we see women recovering faster than men. The following one, please. And why is this? Uh, this crisis has been different, not only in the impact of, on women, but also in the dynamic of those impacts. In previous crises, the typical financial or um, uh, trade crisis, uh, the hard hit sectors were typically those where men dominate. And in the second round of the crisis, when uh, when demand aggregate demand contracted, that was when women were impacted. And then in the third round, when uh, fiscal um, consolidation investment um, uh, took uh, place, and then uh, those uh, that was the round when uh, when public sector um, uh, constraint meant typically um, um, uh, fewer uh, resources channeled to uh, care services like education or health. This crisis was different because women um, uh, suffered the, Im the first round impact because of the structure of the employment uh, and because they were the ones who were employed in the service sectors hardest hit by uh, by the crisis. So in in this uh, in this um, uh, charts, uh, I will invite you. Then uh, I can share the publications. But in these charts, we see that the 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 sectors that explain uh, the contraction of employment of women and men are those hard hit sectors uh, or mid mid to to hard hit sectors uh, in terms of of the services and also in some manufacturing like apparel and and footwear where women dominate. This chart that also. Uh, shows that policy matter because the countries Italy and below most of them in 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 Europe show that the impact of the crisis was was less I mean was more for women than and than for men but clearly in a much better position than Georgia or Peru and that was because there were policies implemented to keep women in their to keep to keep everyone in their jobs but the fact that 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 was successful in keeping women in their jobs means that recovery then is easier because we know from previous crises that the moment women lose their jobs and this feeds into inactivity more than in, in unemployment, then it's when it's very hard for them to return when recovery kicks uh, starts. And then and therefore uh, the, the result is that they are left behind in the recovery. The following one, please. Um, there is a, a, a widespread acknowledgement nowadays that 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 um, macro uh, policy has a gender implications, or there is a discussion currently being taking place of the IMF strategy for gender mainstreaming, where there is uh, the recognition of the macro criticality, uh, and I'm using exact words, uh, of the macro criticality of gender inequalities. However, these are taken as things that happen 
outside the realm of economy. Um, something that happens over there uh, in the access of education, health services, uh, legal rights, violence against women, cultural barriers that feed into the economy and therefore feed into uh, macroeconomic outcomes. Uh, it is as if nothing in the structure of the economy was um, was uh, conditioning this these outcomes, whilst our reading is that it is exactly where women are and are working and those sectors uh, and the informality which cuts across um, uh, these sectors and made the women being the first to lose their jobs or to be fired if in, in, in uh, wage positions be part of the picture. So in moving to what we call an integrated, uh, and could you move to the, yes, an integrated gender responsive macro economic uh, framework, we, we under, it is integrated because we understand both demand and supply dimensions, but we are not, we, we shouldn't stop in thinking that um, skill promotion and, and, and uh, the idea that, um, that productivity, enhancing women's productivity will do the trick when we need, in fact, that the policies uh, at the macro level um, bring uh, uh, or provide and enable in environment for a job rate and gender responsive recovery. And by gender responsive, we understand as the explicit um, uh, understanding of how uh, the jobs are going to be generated uh, for women. Where will women uh, work and which these decent jobs are going to be there? Uh, and this is, uh, this is related to the 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 uh, distribution of, of income, the the, the uh, functional distribution of income, before um, social policies and and the the role of redistribution uh, of states takes place. The following one, please. Um, so I wanted to to mention that uh, we also did uh, work on tools and in the framework of the UN Women and ILO joint program promoting decent employment for women through inclusive growth policies and investment in the care policy, we produce a tool how to assess fiscal stimulus packages from a gender equality perspective. And, and the dimensions that Professor Geda and uh, Professor uh, Warris uh, presented before certainly are reflected both in these tools, in th this tool in particular, uh, we have others, and also in the um, uh, in, in in, in the diagnostics we are running in the countries. The following one, please. Um, and I have two to go, I think. Uh, but I wanted to flag also that um, I perhaps, perhaps um, the COVID-19 crisis uh, has brought to the fore gender responsive emergency and recovery policies that were not there before. Of course, not sufficiently, because there are very few uh, in proportion to all measures taken. Yet there are two dimensions that I think are worth um, um, highlighting, because it also paves the path for future uh, gender responsive uh, policies. One of that of those is that uh, gender responsiveness was recognized when when policies were put in place in order to support the sectors or, or the employment of the uh, sectors dominated by women. And the second is that uh, some policies, uh, few but but not um, but not non-existent, recognize and pay care work and the and the the. Um, the burden that went back to, to households, to women in those households when uh, the crisis stroke and, 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 um, and 
schools were closed and, and uh, health systems overstretched. And to conclude, uh, Marina, if you can go to the, not to the following one, please. Um, so moving towards a gender responsive recovery means promoted gender responsive employment policies that address effectively the gender specific effects of the COVID-19 crisis and supports the creation of full and productive employment for women. We believe that it's, it's still very important to promote appropriate public and private investments in care sectors, namely health and education, and that these investments have to come with decent uh, work opportunities, and to avoid recessionary pressures, uh, pressures uh, that we've heard of today very clearly uh, in the example of, of um, Sri Lanka and, 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 and uh, the selected African countries, because recession, we know from the past that recessions and fiscal adjustments hit women harder and that women are more exposed to the impacts of inflation. And in order to have, um, to make, uh, to, to care for the recovery in the sense that is now more uncertain than it was at the beginning of this year and to um, uh, quench uh, inflationary pressures without put in uh, recession as the first uh, tool to, to quench uh, price increases is uh, important in itself and also important be because of the gender uh, distributive dimensions. Thank you very much, um, Stephanie and colleagues. You are muted, Stephanie. Taking yourself and then forgetting, excuse me. Um, so thanks uh, very much, uh, um, uh, Valeria, for uh, that very interesting uh, contribution. I'm uh, keeping an eye on the uh, clock, of course. So we are meant to close by 12.30. That was give us 10 minutes, I suppose. Uh, it uh, will hopefully be fine by all participants if we give it a bit of um, uh, um, flexibility, uh, since we are meant to reconvene at 2.30 in the afternoon. Now, um, just to repeat in terms of uh, anybody from the floor wishing to ask specific questions, either to uh, uh, a, um, uh, one or several of the, of the roundtable participants, please raise your hand. You can do so by going to reactions. If you click on it, you have a raise hand um, function, or you can go to the chat. For now, I don't have, uh, I don't see any raised hands. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but certainly on my screen, I don't see any, and I don't have comments or questions in the chat either. Um, that said, I have a number of, of, of questions, so I will, uh, take these um, into now uh, just to very briefly summarize what we have here is in my view a very rich assessment both from the perspective of specific uh, developing countries um, as well as from the perspective of uh, cross-cutting issues assessment of impact uh, of the COVID-19 crisis both in terms of some uh, very obvious uh, 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 themes namely the, um, the squeeze felt in terms of policy, domestic policy uh, space due to constraints on external uh, 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 finance, in particular in terms of uh, external debt burdens, but not only. Um, in, term, in terms of gender and, and uh, human rights issues, again, we, we, we have similar, a similar scheme saying that um, their proposals, what should be done from those specific perspectives, but also in recognition of the constraints faced. Um, now, let me start with the country experience. It's clearly, um, Ambassador Silva, you, you've described uh, what has turned into a fairly dramatic uh, situation in, uh, in Sri Lanka, beginning with the COVID-19 pandemic, but um, right now. Um, and uh, Professor Gida, you have sort of uh, discussed this for um, uh, uh, Zambia, Ethiopia, Kenya, in particular Kenya, and one can see 
differences in exposure, for example, to uh, uh, commodity price markets, um, but also in terms of different sectoral impacts um, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But the, the, the shared topic is uh, the, the absolutely destabilizing effect of external finance constraints um, on, uh, on these economies and also disappointment with current um, international multilateral, bilateral actors uh, and their uh, ability to bring on board private uh, actors in providing both uh, necessary additional liquidity, let alone longer term so uh, solutions to uh, produce more uh, productive, more constructive approaches on how to uh, manage external financial constraints. If I uh, understood this correctly. Now, in your views and beginning with um, Ambassador Silver, seeing, for example, that uh, um, certainly in commodity markets, what we see is um, petrol prices coming down a little again, but that not necessarily alleviating the current situation in Sri Lanka. What is your expectation as to what, um, through a project such as this, Angtad, um, but perhaps also the wider UN should contribute to address issues and what would be from your point of view the balance between what should come as support of action from uh, the international community and what you see as necessary and perhaps possible in Sri Lanka. Yes, uh, thank you very uh, much, uh, Stephanie, for those questions. I think they are quite uh, quite uh, valid and, and relevant uh, to our discussion. Uh, the, the study conducted by Angtad, I think, uh, uh, made a very uh, constructive and, and, a, and a fair uh, reflection of uh, issues where Sri Lanka has gone wrong. I think uh, it talk of um, monetary policy, the export import policies and other uh, policies. Uh, I think um, uh, the Sri Lanka uh, had many um, dramatic rounds uh, starting from tooth of the pandemic. I think we were not a, a, a good economy in terms of its performance because already we uh, were losing our uh, revenues, export revenues in terms of um, which we managed to air, uh, generate through the tourism sector. Uh, because 2019, we had a, a terrorist attack, uh, which actually prevented many tourists, uh, tourists coming to the country. So already uh, the export revenue uh, in terms of services, goods and services were not doing well. And uh, so then uh, country had to pump a lot of money into the contamination of the pandemic uh, by of buying vaccines and uh, maybe economic, uh, the lockdowns also country lockdowns were also impacting uh, sort of creating a lot of severe drain on, on the economy uh, domestically as well. So uh, be, due to the balance of payment crisis, we actually resorted to some of the import substitution uh, policies uh, by way of uh, curtailing um, the imports. Uh, I think uh, in the context of the WTO, they were seen as uh, some of the uh, restrictive measures uh, and a lot of international community, I think, res uh, requested Sri Lanka to uh, come before the WTO and notify these uh, measures as um, as BOP measures. I think um, even in that context, uh, since the policy space that is given to us uh, within the WTO context uh, which was not so favorable, and therefore we had to uh, resort to other uh, kind of justification measures in terms of the GETS, our GETS commitment uh, in the WTO, because these restrictions were imposed on the banking sector, uh, real, uh, sort of servicing of um, a banking sector. So uh, then uh, I think that was one of the things that uh, we, we managed to uh, convince the international community. Uh, but in all, all alone, uh, the, these lessons I think are quite uh, dramatic. Um, now you also talk about the commodity markets. So when I look at the commodity markets from the point of view of exports and imports, so let me just focus on the commodity markets. Uh, the Sri Lanka, as you know, uh, is a commodity exporter. But I think compared to the rest of the world, uh, uh, particularly some of our leading commodities like tea, rubber, and coconut, 
are exported in value-added form. Uh, but the concentration of these markets are very, very important. Now, uh, significantly, we are concentrating on two markets uh, that are now engaged in a, in a war, that is Ukraine and Russian Federation. And the, so I think uh, all the markets um, to our competitive, competitive countries, uh, though Sri Lanka is the prime source of exporter of, um, I hope I'm audible, uh, I'm getting a message, my internet connection is very poor. Uh, it's okay, no, it's okay. It, it broke up pretty briefly, but it's fine yeah, now. Yeah, so uh, we are an orthodox producer of Ceylon tea, and uh, so that I think uh, our markets are quite specific. So even uh, um, diversification to other markets would become uh, quite um, limited uh, in terms of uh, in the short term. Now, coming to the full, uh, that's why I think I also made a, a pertinent point in my, my intervention. Uh, due to our credit, low credit ranking and, uh, you know, even borrowing, international borrowing has become quite difficult, even because we are not able to release a lot of foreign exchange for, uh, for import of fuel and gas. Uh, so therefore, sometimes we are at the mercy of these suppliers. And that is being, uh, they, are, they are charging high prices. They are actually putting a lot of conditionalities and making uh, the, even the sourcing uh, from those sources are very, very costly. Uh, so uh, now I think government is is making uh, some allowances to some of the foreign suppliers to provide uh, um, these uh, source uh, these goods uh, at a low cost, particularly uh, not uh, you know the payments will not be made in foreign currency in the first instance. So we are uh, sort of talking to the suppliers as to whether payments can be made in rupees in the first place of course after sometimes that uh, that the, that money can be converted into a uh, foreign currency and repatriate uh, to their countries so uh, similar uh, systems are going to be in place now sri lanka uh, even um, now at a at a very very standstill situation in terms of securing inland food items i think sri lanka's uh, nearly 5 5 million population has been secure uh, um, has been identified as food insecure so that is a that is a very difficult situation uh, now i think the projects such as anted is giving us a lot of food for thought uh, I think uh, maybe that uh, eventually when we are working on a package of reform, along with the IMF and other bilateral donors, a lot of lessons that we drew uh, from the UNCTAD reports, and also uh, maybe uh, things like uh, the sovereign debt, uh, you know, sustainability, and also maybe drawing from special drawing rights, uh, mm -hmm. some of the unallocated portions, uh, I think that is something the UNCTAD also uh, discussed with us. Um, and uh, the other aspect is um, looking at Sri Lanka's uh, current state as world well, ranking as a middle, upper, a lower middle income country uh, that actually restricts our, our borrowing capacity because we are not uh, being uh, recognized as a as a as a as a country who can attract uh, uh, maybe zero uh, interest rates or low interest rates, so I think those are some of the aspects that we are looking at. But certainly, we need international solutions as uh, can cannot alone address some of these impact uh, of COVID nineteen and other um, uh, other global issues like the war and also Sri Lanka resorted to the organic agriculture policy that is also really creating a lot of havoc in our agriculture sector leading up to food insecurity in Sri Lanka. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, very much taken on board. Uh, and I hope, you know, in the, in the, in the remaining uh, day and a half also in which we are going to look more specifically at uh, as policy tools uh, related directly uh, to the focus uh, of this project, and that focus in itself reflects, of course, um, the situation. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to further engagement on, on specific uh, issues. And of course, the, your emphasis on um, what should be priorities for the international community, and uh, in our case, of course, also um, um, trying to, to, to move this forward uh, at the UN level, uh, are, are very well taken and certainly very much on our um, 
uh, screen. Now, let me just say I have to, I, I will have to switch to a lunchtime meeting in about um, 15 minutes with a bit of uh, flexibility. Uh, let me, um, Professor uh, Gida, to stay for a moment with the country experiences and clearly um, there are, are very um, uh, clear overlaps uh, on, on a number of issues with um, the experience as uh, uh, um, Ambassador Silva has related them, but there are also differences. The, 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 the commonality, of course, being um, the, um, the strong exogenous uh, factors affecting macroeconomic uh, stability, therefore uh, um, domestic um, policy spaces and domestic abilities to uh, resource uh, to, to to mobilize resources, um, disappointment with the international um, solutions, and in your case, uh, uh, the, the the particular very uh, useful dis discussion of um, uh, disproportionate sectoral impacts, both in terms of um, standard uh, sectors, but also in terms of. Uh, multi, uh, uh, small and medium enterprises gender um, um, effects. Now, can I just ask you briefly, and then uh, just in brackets, of course, you know, you mentioned Zambia and copper and how uh, uh, rising copper prices helped Zambia at least over Zambia at least over some of uh, its crisis. But of course, these are down uh, now again, highlighting the the the, um, the high degrees of. Uh, exogenously influenced at least macroeconomic instability. Now, again, the question to you with this different, uh, different background, what do you think um, should be the priorities for the international community? SDRs, yeah. Yeah. SDRs yes. um, additional lending uh, windows from multilateral uh, institution in the short term and in the long term. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think in the in the short run, uh, I mean for the international community, uh, is to recognize that there is serious liquidity problem. There is huge both domestic and uh, external debt uh, debt burden, and even servicing it is becoming very difficult. In Ethiopia, uh, we spend almost two thirds of our exports to service the debt. Uh, so. Probably as, as a very short term solution could be some kind of restructuring of debt and debt relief would be uh, important. And the second one will be, uh, second point will be uh, uh, domestic resource mobilization is becoming difficult because of you know, the impact of the COVID and also the macroeconomic instability effect of, uh, you know, say, uh, direct borrowing from the central bank, uh, direct advances. Therefore, uh, international organizations uh, such as, you know, IMF, the World Bank in Kenya, for instance, say there are uh, physical, the, the physical space is limited and the kind of growth that Kenya was doing so far has reached, reached a limit. Therefore, it looks like they are heading toward this austerity. But uh, from the studies that uh, we have conducted, I think that kind of approach will, will, uh, will damage the recovery. And rather provision of uh, soft loans to relieve the liquidity problem and focus in the medium term into uh, real productive sectors. Uh, such as import substitution, uh, export sector was stagnated in Kenya, for instance, the same in Ethiopia, and working on, on the export sector, and also more on food security and agriculture sectors in the medium term will be a, a good idea, I think. Thanks, Stephanie. <clears throat> um, thanks, Professor Geda. Um, clearly, uh, as you will be aware, there are uh, certainly debates for what for, for, for what that is worth um, ongoing in the UN that try to focus in uh, exactly these points, namely to um, promote uh, concessional lending, including um, to, to, to middle income countries uh, with ch uh, changed uh, policy conditionalities precisely to yeah, uh, exactly. prosperity, but they are uh, very much in the going and they will of course need support of those analyses. And as I said before, we'll um, uh, uh, certainly the intent 
uh, and relevance of this project has been to provide tools to provide uh, um, uh, disc uh, policy discussion on how uh, these these aspects in particular can be emphasized, yeah, uh, including be you know yeah. through country country um, sharing experiences and therefore trying to build also um, coordination between borrow countries, affected countries, um, to demand uh, international measures to promote such policies. Uh, now let me uh, briefly turn to both um, uh, Professor Varis and Esquivel from the perspective of, of cross-cutting um, issues. Um, again, you've both emphasized, uh, very much reflected also, the kind of issues that have been raised at country experience. Um, and um, Professor Varis made, a, I think, a very good point about um, everybody needing to think about the relationship between rights on the one hand and resource use for whom uh, and how. Now, um, from your perspective, listening you know, to the country experiences and making an argument, for example, um, to, re to reinforce the sovereign right uh, to restructure debt and also to um, um, retain control over tax governance, even where, of course, um, this is international, this is cross-border. Um, what would be your sort of um, closing uh, point of core emphasis and uh, uh, cooperation uh, on this? Is, would it be um, strengthening tax governments primarily? How do you see the relation between that illicit flows more generally and uh, debt issues such that we could get international or, or progress in international governments that uh, safeguards a, a, a progressive understanding of human rights? Thank you, Stephanie. I hope I'm, I'm okay then, I'm clear enough. Yes? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're fine. So, so um, I think I would like to add to the call for the strengthening of the United Nations. Firstly, on the issue of a global tax body, it has already been said uh, on the floor of the sessions, and I think it's really important to continue to emphasize this. I think after Addis Ababa, we made many steps forward, and I think it is time to crystallize and concretize some of those and create a space where all countries can come together and make these decisions. And the whole debate around the issues of tax, uh, of tax sovereignty, of independence of states around it is the reason why the United Nations is, becomes such a critical space for this to take place. And with it, I will tell you a global tax convention will become a critical underpinning, perhaps a framework agreement or a very much specific agreement on exactly what sort of sharing is involved. And these cross-cutting issues have two levels. One is that there are shared resources which are very hard to pinpoint to specific states. And the other is that there are very specific rights that are also cross-cutting that need us to have umbrella coverage. So the time is right for this to go forward. And I will tell you that when it comes to the additional area of uh, debt, that the steps that took place at uh, Addis Ababa, ensuring that the UN take the lead in this space, I think needs to be reinforced further. Mm -hmm. And we should not take a step back from that either. I thank you very much, Stephanie. Very much agreed from our end. And of course, um, you know, core purpose of the project is to put also policy tools at the disposal of affected countries in, in, which are uh, mostly developing um, um, countries to, um, to strengthen their demands in this regard, vis-a-vis -vis, um, the rest of the world in international forum. Um, Professor Esquivel, um, a brief closing question um, comes from me in, in particular. I listened with great interest to, um, to your very interesting um, analysis. Now, you know, we've heard how limited fiscal space is in developing countries in particular. You made the point that, you know, you can see in some European countries, Italy included, um, how if you have uh, policies in place that protect uh, uh, female employment, how that helps the wider um, recovery. But of course, the flip side of this is that when you don't have policy space for very basic, um, even you know, very basic liquidity policy tools, this, uh, th there may be some way uh, to go. But you also emphasize in a different way from Professor Gida the sectoral perspective. So that we're looking at a situation where we have women employed in sectors that will be the hardest hit. You know, and, and when you are in that situation, there may be relatively little in the short term you can do about this. 
So what about policies that ensure that women are not concentrated in the most vulnerable sectors? What, what, what about that? Uh, yes, and, and, and certainly um, beyond the short term, what this crisis has taught is that um, there are structural issues. That's why I brought up the issue of macro criticality of gender um, um, uh, dimension as if they were uh, just uh, uh, supply side constraints instead of a, a strong, I mean, and, and instead of uh, the relationship to um, structural um, transformation. And I think um, others have spoken um, on, on the tensions between the short term, I mean, even uh, Ambassador Silva, on the tensions between the long term structural transformation that could provide these good uh, jobs vis-a-vis -vis the short term macroeconomic limitations. And, and those are certainly clear. And that's why um, the ILO has emphasized time and again that that relationship between short-term and long-term uh, structural transformation should be the one to have uh, in mind. I think that even if there is a limited fiscal space, uh, there is there are ways to reallocate resources to um, those uh, sectors, in particular the care sectors, that will um, that have the potential to uh, to create decent employment, but also to increase resilience uh, in future health crises. Uh, so that, uh, in in fact, the issue of investment and and channeling resources to um, to investments that would help uh, create employment and um, uh, support uh, uh, the well-being of the population, I would say, uh, are are critical. But yes, as uh, Stephanie, I couldn't agree more. What we need in between the emergency short term and the macro uh, dimensions that give and enable environment is a lot of attention to sectoral policies and gender um, responsiveness of these policies uh, to, to allow women to, I mean, to really change the structure of women's employment, uh, which made uh, them so vulnerable to these crises. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, all of you, um, Ambassador uh, um, Silva, uh, Atya, Waris, and Professor Geda, Professor SQL. Um, that's been the, the final of the sort of setting of stage kind of panels for this. We have another day and a half before us where I am, um, uh, I'm looking forward to, 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 to getting further into depth on the various policy tools that this project in particular has emphasized and further discussion about how to take this forward, um, uh, what other uh, policy tools perhaps, you know, to also consider and also, of course, to continue um, effective um, work that really is relevant at country level um, to the country's concerns. So we're very much looking um, forward uh, to this. It's been uh, obviously in the crisis moment, a relatively broad um, project, um, which uh, I think is on the one hand very inspiring, has led to a lot of dialogue um, that we need to leverage uh, in future, uh, beginning with the remainder um, of, this, uh, of this workshop. Very much so I leave you to your lunch break now. Um, I have to say, I have, I, I would, uh, I will be looking forward to uh, um, people daring to raise their hand <laughs> in future in future uh, uh, sessions. I I hope I haven't overlooked anybody. I have my system up in front of me, and, and uh, that doesn't look um, uh, as if anybody raised their hand. But in case I've overlooked anything, my apologies. I'll pass back briefly to Penelope, who will uh, be moderating the next panel at fourteen at two thirty. So in slightly less than a couple of hours, uh, that begins the first step into, into looking into the work uh, and discussion of the work um, on specific policy tools. Penelope, over to you briefly. Thank you very much. And thank you, Stephanie, uh, Ambassador Silva, uh, Professors Juarez and Escarel, and Professor Jeddah. It's really been a pleasure to have you on the session. Thank you for um, really enhancing this, this contextual moment for us. Um, and we really hope that this could be the start of more collaborative work together. Um, thank you now, for, for the invitation. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank and we'll see you, you all back much. here at 2.30. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.